Okay. So uh, I want to welcome everyone to the Stanford Global Studies Summer Film Festival. My name is Ekaterina Mojaeva, and I'm the Event and Communications Officer at the Center for East Asian Studies. The theme of our virtual summer series is Feeding Your Soul. And what better film to uh, discuss this theme than Jiro Dreams of Sushi. This evening's discussion of the film is the first of seven films we are presenting this summer. Uh, this film, Jiro Dreams of Sushi, is sponsored by the Center for East Asian Studies. Today's discussion will be led by Rosalie Guy, a PhD student in Japanese literature at Stanford. So Rosalie's research focuses on depictions of food, appetite, and effective descriptions of eating in modern Japanese literature. Rosalie recently completed her MA in Asian Studies at the University of British Columbia. Her MA thesis is, uh, was Eating After the Triple Disaster, New Meanings of Food and Three Post-311 Texts which examines how food takes on new emotional and bodily dimensions in literature and media after the natural and human-made disasters of 311 or the Fukushima nuclear power plant disaster. So her, new, uh, her favorite kind of sushi is aji or horse mackerel, but she also has a soft spot for anything with spicy mayo on it. So before we begin, this discussion will last for approximately one hour and you will only see the speaker and the discussant on the video. The discussant will give her introductory remarks first, and we will open the floor for the Q&A. Uh, we encourage you to participate um, in the discussion by asking questions using the Q&A feature on Zoom at the bottom of your screen. If you wish to ask your questions directly, please note, that, um, please note this in your Q&A question. So when you click on Q&A, if you would like to ask your question directly, Make a note of that and I will try to turn on your audio and mic so that you can ask the question verbally. I can also read the question on your behalf. So please note that the session will be recorded. If you would like to add your name to our Summer Film Festival mailing list, you can visit the news and events section of the Stanford Global Studies website. We only use this list to send information about international films. So with that, thank you for coming and we hope that you enjoyed the film. So Rosalie, take it away. Thank you so much, Ekaterina. Um, so I'm going to, I have a PowerPoint, so I am going to share it. Um, can we see it? Is everything okay? Okay, thank you. All right. Um, so uh, um, then let's just get started. I'm going to talk for about a 12 to 15 minutes, depending on how fast I end up talking. Um, but it's just remarks on the film and a few bits of extra information I thought would be interesting for everyone. Um, okay. An idea that comes to someone in a dream is a divine act of inspiration. It's also proof that Onojiro's devotion to making delicious sushi is more than just a conscious logical act. Uh, it's something that he carries with him at all times. He loves his job. He tells us in the beginning that mastery comes from dedication, from love, from never complaining. And Jiro's dreams of sushi must be another sign of that dedication and love, fueling him and keeping and pushing him to keep working all for the sake of making better sushi. I think it's easy to see sushi as a symbol of Japan's place in the imaginations of people globally. It's often the first food that comes to mind when Japanese food comes up. Japanese restaurants all over the world serve it, transforming it to fit the varied palates of their local customer base. It seems deceptively simple, fish and rice, salt, sugar, vinegar, and experience, but it has a complicated and deep history and cultural meaning. It's an object inherited with hierarchical artistry and traditional ideals easily made elitist or inaccessible, depending on the time and place. Some people will never touch it because they're averse to the idea of eating raw fish. Some could eat it every day, uh, if not for cost, accessibility, and fear of mercury poisoning. Our unending desire for it comes at a cost, economic and environmental. So she carries with it all of these diverse meanings and concerns um, and before we get into the film, I'd like to touch on the history of sushi in Japan and globally. So, um, 
from pre-modern Japan up until the mid Edo period, uh, sushi was mostly still, you know, as we think of it, fish, rice, and salt, but it was incredibly different. Um, it usually meant fish packed in like barrels with cooked rice and salt and left to lacto ferment, so kind of like sauerkraut or kimchi for anywhere from a week to many months. Other forms of sushi developed in the medieval and Edo periods, such as press sushi, box sushi, and sushi rolls. Um, different areas of Japan made different kinds of sushi as well, depending on local food customs and ingredients. And by the late Edo period, the form of sushi that we think of today and what you see on your screen and in the film, uh, the nigiri sushi, the hand-shaped fish on top of balls of rice seasoned with salt and vinegar was a very popular snack food rather than a meal. Uh, this kind of nigiri sushi was popularized in Edo, the um, capital and what we know today as modern day Tokyo. Um, it could be eaten standing up at any of the many stalls or restaurants around the city. Um, and in the uh, modern period, so Meiji, Taisho, Showa, so 1868 to, you know, uh, say 19. 30s or so, uh, many more sushi restaurants popped up, including, and it can be found at places like department stores, which uh, first appeared in Japan in the 1910s in the dining halls. Um, it was still a relatively mass food. It was kind of a cheap food, um, even as it gained prominence among uh, food writers and critics in the 1930s. However, in 1939, due to increasing regulation from the government on what and how Japan's national subject should be eating, um, sushi stalls were banned for sanitation reasons. Late in the same year, the sale of white rice at restaurants were outlawed, uh, was outlawed because it wasted the nutritional bran of unpolished rice, so brown rice. And then in 1941, dining out was outlawed unless you had a government issued ticket. And then finally in 1944, um, all restaurants were ordered to close. So this all accompanied the increasingly ration-based food supply that grew scarcer and scarcer as the war carried on. Um, and this isn't to say that people didn't eat sushi at all, um, depending on where you were, um, like in rural areas, sometimes uh, there's evidence that people made uh, local kinds of sushi as late as 1941. Uh, and after the war ended, um, post-war Black markets had lots of food stands, but um, rare, almost never sushi ones because sushi relied on rice, which was hard to come by even after the war had ended. And most restaurants were not allowed to reopen until 1949 officially. The post-war economic cover recovery though, um, saw a boom in refrigerators, which meant a greater variety of fish could be kept and served. Changing tastes also meant that people started preferring larger oily fish like tuna. Uh, like Jirasan Yoshikazu notes in the documentary, fatty cuts of tuna used to be served cooked, probably to render some of the oil and because it was an undesirable part of the fish. Now it's one of the most popular toppings for sushi. And the occupation of sushi chef became more professionalized and systematized in the post-war era as well, including formal licensing processes started in the 1950s for chefs in general and in 1983 for sushi chef licenses. And today in Japan, you might mostly eat sushi at places like conveyor belt sushi restaurants, standing bars, you can get it at supermarkets. There are plenty of reasonably priced sit down restaurants. And of course, there are also high end fine dining places like Jiro's. Um, sushi is still rarely made at home. Although there are some exceptions such as chirashi sushi or temaki sushi, which are much easier to assemble than nigiri and they require little specialized equipment. And outside of Japan, sushi has found its place in the appetites of people all over the world. There is a Japanese restaurant in every continent. Um, maybe not Antarctica. Don't, I, I'm not sure about that. Don't quote me on that. Um, in the US though, this started in the 1960s, although um, depending on the Japanese um, American population, um, there were Japanese restaurants that served sushi, um, but um, generally in the US that started in the 1960s as the palates of diners became more open to uh, Japanese food and extended through the 1970s uh, globally as Japan's economic growth and increased cultural power made people more aware of Japan. This is also when the California roll was invented sometime in the 1960s or 70s, depending on who you ask um, in Los Angeles. 
And again, today there are sushi restaurants all over the globe. And to meet the demands for this appetite we have for sushi, the global fish stock has taken a toll as the film mentions. Um, yes. So uh, to return to the film though, and to take a back step from a step back from today, it is this return to sushi during the post-war economic recovery of Japan that Jiro's journey to making better sushi really takes off. He says he innovated new dishes in something with such a long history that previous sushi masters said it could not be improved any further. So these little improvements, massaging octopus for longer and serving it warm, making freshly boiled shrimp for that Jiro style two piece cut that you see on the screen, even though it all takes more work, it's worth the improvement in taste. As shokunin, um, Jiro and his apprentices say that they care more about the final product than the profit they'll make for it, from it. So improvement comes not in leaps and bounds, but in the gradual incremental gaining of skill and knowledge that comes from doing the same thing every day to get ever closer to the unattainable peak of the craft. And even if Jiro hasn't reached perfection, he gets closer every day by re constantly renewing the menu. As the food critic Yamamoto in the film points out, it was only seven years ago at the time of the filming of the film, so probably would have been 2004 or so. Um, it was only at that time that the structure of the tasting course that we see in the film was created. Moreover, the network of relationships Jiro has built with the suppliers is one based on trust and certainty of their skill in selecting the right ingredients for him. They trust him to make the best of their ingredients in return. Um, and his apprentices hone their skills under the watchful eyes of Jiro and his son, uh, Yoshikazu, who still works at the main branch. And they'll all carry their capital with them forever as they go on to open their own restaurants. Um, but they'll never be Jiro. Right. Jiro is one of a kind. His sushi restaurant is uh, very focused on his philosophy and focus on sushi and sushi alone. Right. They don't serve appetizers. Um, they only serve sushi. Um, and as one of Jiro's former apprentices notes, um, the son Yoshikazu, the eldest son Yoshikazu, will have to be twice as good as his father to be seen on the same level. And throughout the film, we see that Yoshikazu feels that pressure, but he still carries on under his father at the main branch of Tsukibayashi Jiro. And the film also notes at the end, right, that it's Yoshikazu, not Jiro, whose hands shaped the sushi that got the restaurant those Michelin stars. Um, and this shows that chasing the dream of perfection, of chasing Jiro's dream through these sort of fine details and practice execution reveals that Yoshikazu will be able to carry on the torch of Jiro's dreams. Right. So it's all of these things going on in the background that create the experience for the eater. And in case, in, in this case for us, the viewers, right, the entire film is kind of like this meal at Tsukiba Eshijiro. It goes through the different pieces of sushi that we get to eat if we sat down at the counter of Tsukiba Eshijiro. The climax is this gorgeous set of scenes of the preparation of each piece laid tantalizingly down in front of us as the orchestral soundtrack swells. And as Jiro notes, it isn't the ingredients individually uh, that makes deliciousness, but the balance of all the elements together, whether that's the fish, rice, and vinegar of the sushi or the narrative image and music of the film that tell us about what the feeling and meaning of dining at Jiro's restaurant uh, is, are. And Ono Jiro is now in his mid nineties and based on some reviews and reports I found on the internet is still working at the restaurant. Um, his ongoing pursuit of perfection of better sushi has been passed on to how each of his apprentices on to each of his apprentices and sons. Um, but even if they shoulder the burden of much of the hardest work, as Jiro makes known at the uh, end of the film, they're all doing what he taught them. It's Jiro's sushi, built by his hands, supported by his dreams. If his sons and apprentices do the same thing over and over again, constantly trying to improve what they make, then they can continue per reaching for perfection the same way that Jiro would. And for these reasons, for all of these reasons, when I was asked to give this presentation and connect the film with the theme Feeding Your Soul, I honestly panicked a little. When I first saw the film, 
gosh, eight or nine years ago. Um, it had fundamentally transformed the way that I saw sushi and even the practice of making and cook, making food and cooking. But in my memory, what was left was the negatives mostly. The strictness, this impression of like the father's dream onto the sons, the impending doom of climate change and overfishing, the anxiety of being watched so closely while eating. How was something like this film supposed to feed my soul? But while rewatching it, I realized that Jiro's dream of loving what you do so much that you can always pursue something better and relentlessly work towards perfection is a dream that speaks to us because it's so straightforward. Like sushi, the formula of love, effort, and sacrifice seems simple, but it isn't easy to execute constant, consistently day in and day out. And in the context of the economic precarity that's lingered since the bubble burst of the 1990s and Lehman shock of 2008, the COVID-19 pandemic now, the environmental anxieties of climate change, human-made disasters and overfishing, and the general unknown future ahead. Films like this still allow us to feel a sense of fulfillment and hope by telling a story that reminds us that if we endeavor to the joy of creation and improvement, um, if even if perfection is unattainable, if we keep doing what we do with care and attention, we can take pride in our work and we can take pride in what we love. Moreover, just generally, like the food in this film looks delicious and it sparks within us a respect for the labor of its creation and the social connections between supplier, chef, and diner on both local and global scales. Knowing these stories and the struggles makes us imagine the food tastes even better. The reputation and allure of Tsukibash Jiro persists today through hard work, international recognition, and maybe a little help from this film, right? It maintains its high acclaim. And despite everything going on in the world, maybe it's okay for us to buy into that dream of perfection or of working hard to try to reach perfection a little for the hope that if it worked for Jiro, maybe it'll work for us. And Today, most people will never get a chance to dine at Tsukibayashi Jiro. It's currently closed to reservations from the general public, which is why it was removed from the Michelin Guide a few years ago. Um, while Japanese restaurants or Japanese residents can make reservations over the phone, they're very hard to come by. And visitors from overseas hoping to get a seat at the counter must go through a concierge at a luxury hotel months in advance. Um, but I think that even if we can't eat at the restaurant, we can certainly dream of it. And we can ask ourselves, these kinds of questions. How does learning the stories and journeys of other people feed our souls? What makes any food worth eating? And most importantly, what fulfills us most and brings us comfort in these, and please forgive me for the canned phrase, unprecedented times. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much uh, for your wonderful presentation um, and for bringing sushi into context for us as well as this film. So we are now open to audience questions. Uh, you can put these questions in the Q&A um, and I will start us off with a quick question and then we will go ahead and go through what you have, uh, the questions you have submitted already. And thank you so much to everyone who has submitted some questions for us. So the first question is um, my own, if I can uh, take advantage of being the, uh, the moderator. Mm -hmm. So in the film, Jiro discusses how you must develop your senses to learn how to eat to be a great chef. So he talks about the nose and the sense of taste of another chef and how he feels that if he had this other chef's sense of smell and taste, that he would be an even greater chef himself. Um, his food is also compared uh, to a concert, how there's ebbs and flows to his presentation of sushi. So there's this understanding that eating isn't simply the act of digesting food for sustenance, but also engaging in all of the senses. How do you think his philosophy uh, of eating um, and this philosophy also of engaging all the senses is compatible with sort of the modern ubiquity of sushi? Mm -hmm. Right, as you point out, it's now global food. Um, it's available in supermarkets, not just uh, in Japan, but even in, uh, you know, uh, for example, in the United States, in states that are smack dab in the middle of the country, which are so far removed from a coast uh, where you would find this kind of fish. Mm -hmm. So um, again, so what do you think, how do you think this uh, is compatible to his sort of eating philosophy? 
Yeah, I think it's really, really complicated because for the most part, like we're like the kind of eating philosophy that Jero presents, I think that if we generalize it enough, right, it's about taking pleasure in your food of really like feeling it with all of your senses. When he cooks, of course, he has to taste everything, all of the chefs and all chefs in general, right? Fine dining chefs, regular chefs, like they taste their food as they make it. You know, it's um, it's about eating with the eyes. We know this phrase very well. Um, and I think that, you know, all eating should be linked to all of the senses. Um, it's something that all of us can engage in every day as we eat. Um, on the other hand, I do think that there is certainly a very stark divide in the way that, um, right, like we can expect ourselves to engage in sushi in the way that Jiro, right, feels mm -hmm. sushi, right? Well, we can take his philosophy and think that, yes, I should enjoy my food. I should look for what's delicious and I should, you know, like, um, try to taste for all of the things that, you know, the person making it put in the effort. It should all come together really, really well. Um, the American palate, for example, is different from, based on, you know, what we eat growing up, um, is often a little bit different from the kinds of food that you'll get in Japan without, you know, essentializing things. Um, and therefore, I think that, you know, our experience of eating sushi, right, like, a lot of us are used to eating things like rolls, Spicy mayo, I love spicy mayo. Um, it's on a lot of sushi found in America, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think that if, right, like, you know, for example, someone like Jero was to eat a spicy tuna roll, he might be concerned <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because it's not what he would think of as being sushi, right, necessarily. But I also think that, you know, you know, he's trying to work on a level that's way, way, way up here and um, he's worked, you know, for, he says he's worked in, at the time of this film, he's worked for like 70 years making it eating sushi, right? So his way of thinking about sushi in particular is very, very, very specific. But, you know, he eats other food. I'm sure he likes other food. I'm sure he sits down and he enjoys other food, right? Um, it's maybe that when he eats, I'm assuming here, maybe when he eats, he engages with it at a very specific level based on his years and years and years of experience and training as a chef. So he's looking for something very, very specific. I think that if we are looking for something different, if we're looking for our own pleasure and we like eating, you know, California rolls and we like eating spicy mayo and we like eating uh, like um, those deep fried rolls, then if we're engaging with it on a level that goes beyond just, you know, sustenance, right? then mm -hmm. I think we're embodying that philosophy perfectly well. Great, thank you for answering my question now. Um, I will move on to the questions that were submitted to us by uh, our audience. Thank you again. So uh, Raul Estrada uh, asks, the art of what do, um, of what do you think, um, Heinz, okay, let's see. Is that going to dish or are you creating? Um, so the art of sort of creating and tackling a new dish, um, how do you think the feeling of creating that dish came from? So how did, what is um, the approach to kind of tackling a new dish? Mm, I think for Jiro, it's probably, right, he has, it seems like based on the film, um, it seems like he has an image, some sort of like platonic ideal of sushi, mm -hmm. right? Um, but he's not probably entirely sure of how to, you know, reach that ideal. And he also knows that this, like this perfection of sushi is something that is unattainable. But what he can do is, you know, like try to make little bitty improvements, right? So the stuff that he's making, right? The techniques that he uses in the film, they say that they're nothing particularly special, right? Um, mm -hmm. So speaking specifically to uh, Jiro and his restaurant and his um, apprentice of sushi, right? They're mm -hmm. not necessarily trying to make things extremely new. They're not trying to innovate the sushi itself. Um, they're trying to just make it better and better and better and better, right? Mm -hmm. And fit a specific kind of, uh, you know, try to get it ever closer to that ideal. Mm -hmm. So it's probably a lot of experimenting, maybe a little bit of divine inspiration and a lot of practice more than it is a 
super duper conscious mindset of, you know, let's make something new. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, we have a question here from Carol Starbuck. Rosalie, have you had the honor of eating there and meeting him by chance? If so, can you describe it? I wish. I don't have the money. So it costs, you know, it, at, back then it cost, um, you know, over uh, 30,000 yen, so approximately 300 USD um, to eat their, you know, 30 minute meal, maybe. Um, today it costs even more. Mm -hmm. And it's so hard to get um, reservations. Mm -hmm. um, but what I do love doing is I love reading reviews of people who went to the restaurant and uh, go there. And it's really fascinating how interesting the sort of ways the different people and different people's expectations then affect how they experienced the food and the atmosphere there. So if you take a look, there are plenty written in English. Um, so, oh, if I had the chance to go though, I definitely would, mm -hmm. um, even if it would probably be really anxiety inducing. Yeah, yeah, I would imagine it would be. Um, I think in the, in the film, somebody comments about how you feel like you're being watched as you're eating, even though you're, you know, you're the, um, you're the customer in the restaurant. So I could imagine that's very intimidating. So um, Melissa Rolfs, I hope I said your name right, says, no question, but I wanted to share that one of the greatest travel related experiences I've ever had was visiting the Tokyo fish market at about 3 a.m. Um, so in addition to being able to see the fish be auctioned at 3 a.m., there's also a lot of, um, Sushi, this is, now I'm just adding to Melissa's comment. There's a lot of uh, sushi restaurants uh, and little sushi stalls around there. Uh, was that, have you had the experience of eating there or what has been your favorite sushi experience at in, in Japan? Um, if you could share that with us. Yeah, so um, the Tokyo, the, the Tsukiji market that they go to in the film is actually, um, it's been split up now into, it's always been the inner market, which is like wholesalers, fishmongers, it's for red, like people who run restaurants, really. Um, and then there's the outer market, which is where um, visitors can go. So that's where uh, most of the restaurants are. There are plenty of restaurants in the inner market as well. Um, but the inner market has been moved to Toyosu, which is a slightly mm -hmm. different part of Tokyo. Um, but the outer market is still there. Um, the last time I went to Tsukiji was the, it was before they moved to Toyosu and I've eaten there a few times. Um, it's always been a really, really great experience. It is, last time I went there, it was extremely, extremely crowded. Um, mm -hmm. And I think before the move, there were still, you know, it was still like all the actual people doing their business. Mm -hmm. um sort of driving carts and stuff around and you know people get in the way I got in the way of one and I got yelled at by a dude once um so I felt really bad but it's a really really lovely experience and I think that once the pandemic is over um although the uh the inner market is where the tuna auctions are, mm -hmm. are held and those have now been moved to Toyosu the outer market is still there and it's still active um but the uh the, the tuna auction is actually now uh because it's in Toyosu, they've been able to build an actual like viewing platform. Oh, wow. Well. So it's actually more convenient now to watch the tuna. Yeah. Auction. Yeah. I remember, I think I, when I went there in 2010, um, yeah, no one was happy to, to have people kind of watch from the outside. So mm -hmm. I'm glad that that's been added. So we have a couple of questions that are similar in nature. So I'll, I will read them both. Uh, so we have Karen Yamashita, who's asking globally, why are sushi shokunin mostly men? And then we have another question in a very similar uh, vein from Melissa Hosek. I noticed that there weren't any women in Jiro's kitchen. Is this just a coincidence or is there a gender dynamic to sushi production? Perhaps just in food service. Um, so uh, thank you. And then, oh, um, then there's another one from an anonymous attendee. Why not pass the sushi art craftsmanship to creative girls or ladies? So I think this question of the gender dynamic of both sort of this fine dining uh, in Japan and also just a, a greater curiosity about the role of women um, in sushi uh, seems to be of interest to our audience. So if you could please comment on that. Yeah, definitely. So sushi in general and today is still 
a very um, men, it's dominant, it's a field dominated by men in Japan and I think outside of Japan as well, although there are of course plenty of exceptions. Um, in Japan, there are a lot of, um, you know, I've thought about this question before and I, I did a lot of, I did some research trying to figure out why, and there were quite a few different explana explanations. Um, the most, the one that makes the most logical sense is that um, the family structure of Japan, um, the traditional family structure um, from the past was sort of, to be a shokunin or to, you know, you know, specialized in a craft, you basically had to be working all the time or most of the time. And uh, based on a lot of, you know, history of ideology that um, women were sort of expected to stay at home, take care of the children, raise the children, educate the children. Um, and that sort of persisted up until um, fairly recently, I think in history. Um, because of that sort of divide in expectations for men and women, it, was, it would be very, very difficult for women to take up the craft um, of like the craftsmanship at that sort of like intense level. Uh, you know, and there's, you know, there's a lot to be said about that um, from a very content, like a modern day perspective. Um, mm -hmm. But that sort of, I like that sort of way of thinking has sort of persisted. There are also much less, you know, personally like appeasing explanations. Um, although I think that some of these sort of false ideas still do persist among certain um, people, things like women um, menstruate. So they're not inherently as clean as men. Things like, you know, women's hands are slightly warmer than men's. Um, so their, that their hand temperature will affect the fish adversely and it will ruin the experience, right? Like sort of these like bogus um, reasonings that um, you'll hear sometimes, um, but, you know, I think that those are far less, you know, valid mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe than the, uh, the just work divide family expectation, a historical perspective. Um, but, you know, there are plenty of uh, women sushi chefs and they've been sort of popping up. There are places in, I saw uh, an article once about a um, place in Akihabara, Japan, in Tokyo, that only had women sushi chefs. Hmm. Right? So, you know, it's a growing world. Yeah, expanding opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is a good uh, opportunity to segue into a set of questions we have sort of about the um, discipline and the work ethic uh, related to, that is shown in this film through Jiro and his sons. And so I'll read a couple of questions that will group together um, that kind of have a similar theme. So um, let's see. Uh, for example, we have from Steve Levin, tell us more about Japanese values today, about discipline and the pursuit of perfection. What is their origin, history, and future? So I'll, um, there was another question uh, about how, let me, uh, let me quickly find it. Apologies. Um, oh, there, uh, there's also a comment from uh, uh, Ren uh, Morabia. Uh, do you think Jiro put too much time into his work? Uh, so sort of this theme of, of the work ethic and discipline. Um, and then there's another question that was in the chat from Stacey Heron. Uh, is part of the Japanese culture and mindset the idea to do the same thing over and over again um, every day as Jiro does in his craft? This may be overstating it, but I think uh, there would be resistance among workers in, in this country, meaning the U.S., to do what might be seen as repetitive work. So these questions of uh, sort of work ethic, discipline, um, and the, the culture of the pursuit of perfection. Hmm. These are really good questions and sort of very ones that I'm not certain that I can answer fully adequately um, as an American person, um, first of all. Um, and in Studying Japan, one of the things that I think that is really important and, you know, learning about other cultures is that um, 
we should be wary of not, you know, attributing everything that's different to being because a country is a country, right? Mm -hmm. um, or making or saying that, you know, this is better or worse, right? There's different cultures, different mindsets. Um, and, but I do think that, you know, like, because there's just still such a strong, maybe, sense of like shokunin being present in the daily cultural sphere of Japan, maybe that that um, idea of like working really, really hard on just one little thing and focusing really hard on that. Um, you know, I, I, maybe that's more prominent and more at the forefront of people's minds um, in Japan, just because of it being there. Uh, more prominently. I also think that, you know, the idea of pursuit of perfection and chasing like the basics and developing those and doing the sorts of same things every day, right, that's at the basis of a lot of um, just general work um, in both Japan and the US, right, like, um, you know, it's a very sort of like chefs who get trained formally, right, um, mm -hmm. I think that if you asked people who work in the restaurant industry, especially the sort of like higher dining places, the finer dining places in the US, I think that, you know, they might also tell you that like, especially if they've had like French style training, right? That, you know, they had to cut onions until they were perfect or they had to like do these same sorts of really basic tasks over and over again to build the foundation that would then allow them to, you know, um, find their own style, find their own way of cooking. Um, I do think that um, you know discipline is something that definitely exists in cooking and um, cooking professionally in general and I think that it's something that is at the root of you know sports as well yeah. especially in the US uh, if we think of like we love sports here. Mm -hmm. right? Lots of countries in the world love sports, but maybe that's, you know, thinking of how discipline and ideology in sports works. Um, I think that's applicable, that general idea is applicable not only to, you know, Japan, but also to the U.S., to other countries all around the world. So. Yeah, I was thinking of, you know, with the Olympics coming up, you know, to tie it in with, with Japan as well, you know, you think of how much time athletes put in to uh, be great and to be the best in the world. Um, you know, uh, I, I enjoy watching I don't, gymnastics in the Olympics and to see kind of the degree of perfection and precision that a gymnast has to do kind of reminds me a little bit of that as well. So I, I think um, that is a very uh, accurate observation, especially with sports, um, but also with music or a lot of, uh, a lot of disciplines that require discipline to, to achieve. So yeah. um, we have a question from uh, Alan Bennett. Uh, why was Western music used in the soundtrack? I, I should have done more research and read more interviews with the actual director and producers of the film. I don't have an actual answer for it, um, but I do think that the effect of it in the film and like, I'm, I'm very grateful that they chose um, like, to not go with the sort of like easy route, which would be to choose like really traditional like Japanese sounding music. Um, but I think that it goes back to the, you know, the food critic Yamamoto, right? He compares, um, like a Katarina you were saying, he compares eating a gyro's like an orchestra, a symphony, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the entire course of the film we hear almost entirely this like, you know, he has Bach and I don't know other composers, <laughs> I don't know many uh, Western composers, but we hear this sort of grand orchestral thing. And I think that it's probably because it's a film made for Western audiences. Um, it's probably the kind of music that we're familiar with and the sort of like the orchestral um, analogy is really, really easy to latch on to and make sense of, right? Um, it's there, it's, you know, the three part, symphony, right? Um, and I think it has a really emotive effect as well, right? Like the music mm -hmm. swells when something really, really uh, amazing is happening in the kitchen. It's sort of a little bit softer when Jiro's talking about his philosophy or, you know, his mm -hmm. sons. Yeah. 
All right. Um, we have a question uh, here that says, I love this movie, but was surprised to hear how Jira mentioned that fish are disappearing from this menu. I'm wondering, if, I'm wondering, should we limit sushi production to artisans? Do we really, really need sushi in vending machines or in grocery stores? Ooh, that's a hard question. That's a really, really difficult question because it comes down to issues of, you know, accessibility, right? Like, who has the right to eat sushi? At what points should we eat sushi? Um, mm. It's a question that gets taken up by, um, you know, Eric Rath released a, a history of sushi recently this year, and I think it's really, really fascinating. Um, but it's one of the questions that he takes up at the very end. And I think that, yeah, it's, it's really, really sad thinking about the fact that like, you know, these fish are disappearing due to overfishing and also probably uh, climate change. <laughs> um, for example, um, rising water temperatures changes the uh, migration paths of tuna. Um, but you know, like tuna, like uh, bluefin, yellowfin, and big eye tuna are still overfished. Even as of 2020, they're extremely overfished. Um, there are uh, other tunas available, um, but the issue is that a lot of, you know, the demand is there for the, you know, sort of the higher uh, ranking tuna, let's say, the ones that are familiar, the ones that are the classics. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the solution, and I'm totally stealing this from Eric Raff, uh, but I think that the so if there is a solution, it's not that only artisans should be able to make sushi, right? I think that, you know, something like sushi is, like, it would be impossible to stop the spread of it now to only artisans, right? You can get it at a supermarket, at a convenience store, you can get it at a gas station. Um, you can make it at home, right? Like, you, we shouldn't limit this food to only certain types of people or only certain types of people can make this food because I think that that leads it to a whole different set of problems of elitism. Um, but I do think that, you know, maybe the solution is to cut back on, you know, eating the kinds of fish that are overfished, right? If we can reduce global demand for these, you know, um, endangered species of fish, um, the overfished stocks, um, if we, you know, there are plenty of other kinds of fish in the sea, um, <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, if we could make sushi from those and we could, you know, Think about what's available to us locally, right? Um, mm -hmm. Large quantities and try to, maybe this is a time for innovation, right? Try to make sushi from the kinds of fish that we don't normally make sushi from, right? Like maybe that's one of the solutions is to cut back on the demand for the stuff that's disappearing and start eating the stuff that is still plentiful. Yeah. That's a, that's a great point. I think I saw a video on, on YouTube where a local, um, where someone, a, a sushi chef in Seattle, I believe, uh, was showing how to prepare fish uh, for sushi. And he used some local fish in his examples of how to prepare. And I thought that was really, uh, that was really neat. And so I'm, yeah, I like that you pointed that out as a solution as well. We have a question from John Mannion. So, this, uh, it kind of circles back a little bit to something we talked about before. So this particular food struck me as hyper-disciplined compared to things like, for instance, Italian family-style dining or Japanese teppanyaki. Uh, that impacts the entire process, demanding perfection, process orientation. This appears to impact Jiro's relationship with his sons, not in the most flattering ways. He talks about missing their childhoods and there's tension in many of their adult interactions. It's a classic artist trade-off. The question is, is it worth it? So do you think it's worth it? And how do you think this shows to add to John's question, perhaps, um, the impact of chasing, uh, chasing this dream on, on family? You know, family is a really important value to many people around the world, but you know, in, in Japan as well. So do you have any thoughts on that? 
I think if I were forced to take over the family business, I, as a human being, might feel very resentful. <laughs> um, very personally, like, I don't know if it's, I don't, I think if it's worth it or not worth it, I think it depends on the individual person and the individual, like, way of building that relationship, right? Like, <laughs> the it's, yeah, the tension that is there in the film between, right, the issue of, right, um, Takashi, the second son, has, mm -hmm. is now the sort of uh, head of the branch of Jiro in, what was it, Ropongi? Mm -hmm. I think, was it Nihonbashi? Or Nihonbashi? Yeah, he was in Ropongi. Ropongi, okay. Yeah, um, but the eldest son, right, because he has to take over the Ginza restaurant, mm -hmm. right, the, the one that's there in the, in the train station, um, right, like, he's still working under his father, right, um, but the thing is, both of them are so well-trained and so disciplined at this point and that, like, you know, you know, this is their livelihood, right? We don't really get a lot of insight to, you know, any sort of resistance that they actually put forth. You know, Yoshikazu mentions that he wanted to be a race car driver, right? Um, but, and, you know, but, you know, neither of them at Jiro's sort of request. And it's unclear how much of this was actually, you know, like, um, forced upon them how much they actually you know truly agreed to it right like because we just don't get that perspective um right mm -hmm. um both of them at this point they've taken over the craft they know what they need to do they know how to do it and they're going to keep doing it um i think if you ask them is it worth it you know maybe they'd say yes maybe they'd say no but we'd have to ask them to actually be sure so i think it's a very individual issue um. mm -hmm. yeah there's a follow a similar question from an anonymous attendee can you discuss the generational tension in this movie are young people patient enough to apprentice for so long would a son or daughter uh, be that patient to wait to take over mm -hmm. um and i think in the movie at one point they were saying that it's uh I, i'm not sure if it was said exactly uh, that the um the apprentices are in Jiro's uh, restaurant are all pretty old, actually. Mm -hmm. There's a lot, there's fewer younger apprentices. So do you think this is also, um, you know, uh, something that's changing in Japan uh, to add to this attendance question? Yeah, I, I'm not sure about the trends, but I do think that, you know, at the point of this movie um, and maybe even through today, like, um, the idea of having to train super duper hard um, for probably very little pay, um, right? Like, uh, you know, if you work at Jiro's, if you train at Jiro's, you get to train there for free. And it's not mentioned if you get paid at all. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Hopefully you get paid at like a little, like enough to live, but, um, but you, you know, you have to work there for more than 10 years mm -hmm. um, to work your way up the ranks. Um, the we're not given the ages of the other apprentices. Uh, Nakazawa, the one who's talking about the omelet, right? Um, mm -hmm. He's been there for a very long time uh, based on what we see in the film. Um, I think that, you know, part of it is the fact that um, even, I don't think it's necessarily like today, but like even like a generation back, right? It's not necessarily about um, you know, the idea of carrying on something so amazing and traditional and having to do it is a great idea. It's an amazing dream, but it is really, really hard to mm -hmm. stick to it every single day. It requires a lot of discipline. I think that, um, <clears throat> you know, it requires a lot of, you know, sort of divestment from the idea, from the economics of it. Mm -hmm. um from the you know personal capital gain of it um but i do think that you know there are still people still young people who want to become sushi chefs who are willing to go through that sort of training there the numbers might you know since the end of the war their numbers might have slowly decreased um mm -hmm. 
but you know, like, like um, I mentioned in the presentation, there are licensing procedures. Um, you don't have to go through the licensing procedures to make sushi at a restaurant, um, <laughs> but you have to in order to be able to call yourself a sushi chef in Japan. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's lots of different factors of training and how to become a sushi chef. Um, I do think it ends up being individual and personal. Mm -hmm. um, we have another question from Derek Lee. Uh, so um, it's a little bit uh, long, so let me read it. So the Edo Mai style of sushi is quite rare in a lot of uh, omakase courses today. Perhaps this is due to older techniques that may take extensive amounts of time. Do you envision that as time goes on, just as menus change, liver used to be common item in American cuisine, uh, will the Edomai tradition die out or is Japan built different? Will the public appreciate um, Edomai or still prefer to stick with non-traditional fish like salmon, which is scorned by a lot of uh, Japanese uh, itamai? Mm -hmm. So itamai is the uh, you know traditional chef mm -hmm. uh, in Japanese cuisine. Um, I think that tastes are always going to change. Um, it's true that, you know, these sorts of traditions die out, and I think that they can be renewed um, over time, depending on, you know, what people's perceptions of this type of cuisine are, um, people who are trying really hard to preserve it. Um, but to be really, really concise in the answer, the one of the top, you know, toppings for sushi in Japan is salmon. Um, and you know, in the past, like uh, up until I think the 1970s, Japan didn't eat raw salmon very often. Um, it wasn't until I think there was a, some sort of trade relationship built with Norway mm -hmm. um, that, you know, the idea of eating salmon raw in Japan started to become popularized. And now, you know, changing tastes, salmon is kind of a fatty fish. It's very, very palatable um, for children as well. Like um, I remember when I was working and teaching in Japan, I asked my students once what their favorite sushi, like their top three sushis were. Um, almost every single one of them said salmon. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. yeah. Um, let's see. Let's see. Um, there's a follow-up, I think, to our earlier um, mm -hmm. overfishing question, which from an anonymous attendee says, uh, uh, I asked the question because I wonder if others in the industry think that limiting sushi to artisans might be a way of honoring the artists and the cuisine while not encouraging overfishing. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that it's true that, you know, if we limited the idea of making sushi to artisans, right, we could maybe maintain, you know, these traditional ways of making sushi instead of trying to, you know, like make it faster, better, more, um, to fit, you know, the global or the even the local demand for it. Mm -hmm. um, and it would be great if like, you know, there was a way to ensure the maintenance of these sorts of be like ways of eating sushi that are being lost mm -hmm. um, or that are sort of, they're just in inaccessible to people for the most part. Um, but I think that the issue would then end up becoming more of an issue of elitism mm -hmm. and, um, and the overfishing thing is something that is definitely true but I think it comes down to you know like instead of saying only these people can make sushi you can only eat sushi at this kind of time place event mm -hmm. um, you can only eat sushi in Japan right like there there's plenty of sushis that don't involve the kinds of ingredients that are generally overfished you know, mm -hmm. vegetarian sushi rolls, um, you can make sushi with, um, like if there was a way to make sushi with like Asian carp, which we have mm -hmm. plenty of, right? Um, you know, <clears throat> thinking about just what's available versus what's not and trying to make those conscious choices. Um, and then if we as consumers maybe, you know, start seeking those kinds of things, then the industries won't feel the need to mm -hmm. fish the overfish stocks. Um, but I, I definitely do think that, you know, there's a, there's a thought of, you know, what if we limited sushi, but instead of limiting sushi, it's more about limiting the 
the kinds of fish perhaps. The, yeah, the destructive mm -hmm. nature of mm -hmm. uh, the kinds of sushi that we eat. All right, well, we're coming up to sort of the end of the hour. So I'm going to read one last question and my sincere apologies to anyone whose question I was unable to get to. Uh, we're you know, very thankful for your participation. Um, but unfortunately, our time is limited. So I will ask the last question. And it's again, John Mannion. So Jiro to me appeared a foundationally damaged man who deeply resented his parents and created a life of pursuing solitary singular perfection. Do you think the filmmaker intended to present him as a hero or as an anti-hero? That is a really good question. And it's the one that I was struggling with um, as I was watching this film and writing this presentation because, um, you know, I think he can be taken in both ways at once. You know, there's something to be said about what he is doing for Sushi, um, the sort of thing that he's, you know, trying to achieve is something that I think that we can respect and find, take inspiration from, um, you know, but it is also true that, you know, he has a lot of, um, he has a lot of emotional trauma from the past of his father of having getting kicked out of the house at nine, he says, or, eight, or seven or nine, mm -hmm. um, of having to work of, you know, you know, being in an environment where if he complained, he might get kicked out of his, you know, job and not be able to make a living anymore. Um, I think that if we look at the way that he treated his, you know, if the, the way that he, you know, he said he didn't let them go to college, his sons go to college, he didn't um, want them to do X, Y, or Z, they didn't have a lot of money, he wasn't home very much. I think that, you know, both of those things can happen at once. Um, and that this goes back to the question of, is it worth it? Mm -hmm. um, in the film, he says he's happy. Right. He loves sushi. He gets to make sushi every day. When there's good tuna in, he's happy. Right. Um, he gets to do what he loves. Maybe for him it's worth it, but mm -hmm. for the other people around him, you know, there's so much respect that the um, suppliers, the the uh, tuna uh, specialist, the rice specialist, right? They're so mm -hmm. selective and proud of what he can do, right? Mm -hmm. and they would say it's worth it. Um, but I, I, yeah, I do think that there is that tension there of, you know, you make something beautiful, you make something amazing, but at what cost? Yeah. Yeah, that's a question that a lot of uh, great artists or maybe their families <laughs> have, had to, have had to answer throughout the, mm -hmm. the course of history. Um, well, on that note, actually, let's. Uh, there's one last question that I'm going to ask, and it also came in our Q and A. Which local restaurant is the best place to eat sushi, according to your preferences? Oh, okay. <laughs> if we can so, someone. Does anyone have recommendations? Because I've only eaten at one place in Palo Alto. Um, hmm. I can tell you my favorite places in Tokyo. <laughs> I think that would be great uh, for a post uh, post pandemic. Okay. <laughs> so as um, so, please in in the in the chat or the Q and A, please tell me your recommendations, everyone, for places to eat in uh, Palo Alto, in particular, because I need to know. Um, but my favorite places in Tokyo are um, uh, any of the Midori places. So my favorite one is a standing sushi shop in Ikebukuro Station. Um, it's really, really small, but um, the sushi quality is always really, really good and it's pretty cheap. Um, mm -hmm. My favorite conveyor belt chain is Sushiro. <laughs> um, a plate is 130 or 140 yen, so less than a buck 50. Um, and their quality is generally pretty good. And what I like about them is that they choose, um, you know, there are often campaigns where they choose more sustainable uh, fish and mm -hmm. Uh, my favorite sort of slightly nicer place is, mm -hmm. I've only been there once, but it was amazing. It's Gimpei Sushi in Yokosuka. So outside of Tokyo, um, mm -hmm. it's like an hour and a half train ride from Tokyo, but it's so worth it. It's so good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, somebody asked if we could, if we could type any of those oh, up yeah. in the chat. So if you have a second before we uh, 
we turn, uh, uh, we wrap up this webinar. Uh, if you just put some of those in the yeah. chat, that would be great. So, um, you know, I want to thank Rosalie for her uh, wonderful presentation, her insights about sushi, about the film, um, and sort of this uh, in Japanese culture as well. So. Thank you so much for uh, for taking the time to speak to us, and you know I want to thank everybody for attending, um, and don't forget to uh, attend some of the other the other six films uh, film discussions and film screenings for the SGS Summer Film Festival. You can find our uh, mailing list on the SGS website under events. Um, and so again, thank you everyone for coming and Rosalie for your wonderful presentation. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Yep. Thank you. Great.